and welcome to Reflecting on His Word, a Bible study intended to help Christians deepen their walk with the Lord by deepening their understanding of Scripture. exciting to be able to do this and we finally got some of our technological glitches worked out but it's still a little bit of an effort I like better meeting you in person I like better seeing you face to face we're in troubling times these days brethren um, this is more than just a bump in the road this may be headed down the end of the road these are troubling times indeed but fear not we're in the book of Ephesians and remember the first three chapters talked about the very definition of being the universal church. And the latter three chapters talk about what we or how we as the universal church should behave in this lost and dying world. We're finishing up the book of Ephesians today. We're in the latter half of chapter six talking about putting on the whole armor of God. And there's never been a time where it's been more important in our lifetimes, brethren, then right now, this is our moment in history. Uh, make no mistake, this is a very important time for all of Christendom in America, and, and in fact, even the world. These are troubling times. You, you should feel a sense for that, but these are also exciting times because this is an opportunity for all that faith that we've said we had, for all that belief and trust we said we have in God, now's our time to prove it. And if we prove, if we, we make it through this present trial, certainly our Heavenly Father may say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to be that good and faithful servant. Do you? Let's undertake that. And one of the great ways we undertake that is by studying God's Word. So let's open our Bibles to the sixth chapter of Ephesians, and let's study together. So we're in Ephesians Chapter 6, verses 10 through 24. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that the utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, but that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs, and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you allow us to be your universal church. We thank you that you have chosen to give your son to purchase us for yourself. Now help us in light of our role and our obligation and our duty as that universal church to serve you well, putting on your armor, 
being willing participants in the advancement of your kingdom, help us to be courageous soldiers of the light. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Ephesians chapter 6. We're talking about the Christian warrior. And I divided it this way. <clears throat> or maybe I stole somebody else's divisions. I don't know. Um, but this is how it divides up. We talk, first of all, about the warrior. And then we talk about the warrior's foes, who that warrior is fighting, what the resources we as that warrior have. And then, of course, the epilogue. Um, if you watched crime shows, police shows, detective shows back in the early 70s, you know what an epilogue is. Uh, there's a prologue and many books um, in literary works. They have uh, a prologue and an epilogue, um, you know, the, the talking about it before and talking about it after, kind of like I do um, when I'm teaching. Um, I talk about it before I say it. I say it. I talk about it after. Um, some of us just have that gift of gab. Uh, but that's kind of what Paul is doing there. Uh, I guess the detective shows in the 70s wanted to sound very literary. Maybe that's my goal here to sound educated and literary. So let's talk about the warrior. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We have the power available to us, brethren. But if we stand alone, if we go without the armor of God, we will surely fail. We won't be able to withstand in the battle and stand against the wiles of the devil. He is not a weakling. He is not unexperienced. He's been tripping up Christians and destroying lives and churches uh, for eons, ever since the fall. And he's good at it, and we need to be trusting in the Lord. He has is powerful against us as an enemy, but he has no power against our Lord. It's not like God and Satan really can have a wrestling match. Uh, Satan on his best day can't even trouble God on his worst day. Not that he has a worst day, but you get what I'm saying. There is no comparison. The battle is for us to surrender and allow God to make us that Christian warrior, to allow God to equip us with his armor, to allow God to strengthen us, to stiffen us, to help us stand against the wiles of the devil. John 15, 5 kind of encapsulates that. It says, I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. But listen, for without me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing without the Lord. We must be plugged in. We must be plugged into the vine. We must be equipped with the armor. We must be doing things the way God would have us do it so we can be victorious in the battle. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, <clears throat> excuse me, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And he does devour. Like I said, he has destroyed uh, church, individual churches. He has destroyed families. He has destroyed individuals. He will devour those who aren't trusting in the Lord. So we need to be sober. That means we need to be paying attention. We need to be aware. We need to be focused. We need to be vigilant because our adversary roams about like a roaring lion. I can't whip a lion, but if I don't get in the cage with him, if I do what the lion tamer says and stay away from the lion, if I don't loose the chain from around his neck by giving into sin and temptation, then the lion is at bay and he cannot devour me. But if I allow him to maul me, if I go into the cage, if I disobey the lion tamer, if I free him from his bonds by giving into sin and temptation, then I will be devoured. We need to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Let's talk about who our foe is, the warrior's foe. <clears throat> you see, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. It is a spiritual warfare that we're fighting. It is not a physical battle. It's not like we're soldiers with guns going to fight a battle. 
It's not the Christians against the lost folk. It's not the people inside the church fighting the people outside the church. It's not the, the people on the right side of the congressional aisle fighting those on the left side of the aisle, though these fights and battles do exist. There are physical battles. We're talking about the Christian warfare, the Christian battles that we're fighting, and we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against lost people. We're not fighting against evil people. We're fighting against the evil one. We're fighting for the control of the hearts and minds of others and ourselves. If we give ourselves over to evil, our hearts and our minds have not been, we're not keeping them protected with that armor. And if we don't contend for the hearts and minds of lost and evil men, we allow them to be devoured. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're fighting against the evil one. We're fighting that, that eternal battle of good versus evil. And like I said, God has nothing to fear from the enemy. But we do in that if we fail to trust in God, we can be devoured. But we're fighting against spiritual wickedness. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, wherefore, what we need to do is take on the whole armor of God. Now, many men have made a big deal about explaining the uses of the individual pieces of armor and trying to draw a theological connection between those and the uh, spiritual counterpart as the armor is given out. And that's fine. I have nothing against that. But you know, we don't really need to do that if we will do but take care of those things. We need to stand there for having our loins girt about with truth. Now we can talk about what uh, being girt about and having the uh, our loins girded and what that meant in ancient armor. But what I want you to focus on is truth. Are you wrapped in truth? Is truth the way you do things? Can you be honest? Can you be forthright. I remember one time um, I was in, in a ministry position and being attacked by a deacon board. And I had said that what one of the particular deacons had said was not true. And so I was being confronted. Um, I came into my office and the uh, chairman of the deacons was sitting in my chair at my desk and the rest were standing around kind of behind him. It was a very adversarial situation. And the chairman of the deacon said, you called so-and-so a liar. And I said, no, sir, I did not. I said that what he said was untrue. He's not a liar. He doesn't tend to lie. He's, he's usually an honest man, but for some reason, he, what he said was not true. I don't know what's going on in his mind, but what he said was not true. Now, it, we can sometimes get caught up in that earthly adversarial situation. I could have fired back and yelled at those men. And, and I don't, I'm not trying to set myself up as the hero in this. I just, I just stumbled into the, the, the situation and did it right. Not because I was clever, not because I'm good at coming up with clever responses, but I had been fighting the spiritual battle that was taking place in that church. And God had prepared my heart. I was trying to surrender to him and, the truth just came out. And that's how we need to be. If we are prepared with truth, if we are surrendering to truth and making truth how we do things, when we're confronted by evil men, when we're confronted by men who are, are mistakenly taking on an earthly battle instead of the spiritual battle they should be taking on, we will have the appropriate response. God will give us the appropriate response, not because we're clever. I'm not clever. I, I, I walk away from situations all the time and say, oh, I should have said that. Or, oh, I just realized the fallacy of what they told me. I could have shot them down. And fortunately, sometimes God protects me from getting into that, hor that, that earthly plane of struggling with people by just not allowing me to be quick enough to take on that battle. So we need to, it's, it, yes, we, our loins do need girt about with truth, but the important thing is that we have truth. We're living in truth, and truth is the way we do things. Uh, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Of course, a, bless, a breastplate is important, and what's more important in our Christian walk uh, than having righteousness? There's at least one or two other things, but it's so very, very important. It's vital. Without righteousness, we have no Christian walk. 
We need to have truth. We need to have righteousness. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I think in that case, preparation is every uh, nearly as important as the gospel of peace. We need to be prepared. We need to be planning for the battle. We need to be making preparation. And one of the important preparations we need to make is being prepared with the gospel of peace. How in the world can he have victory and then have peace afterward without that gospel of peace? We can't help the Lord win the hearts and the minds of evil men if there's no peace to be promised to them, if they don't know the gospel message that Jesus loves them and has a plan for their lives. So we need to be prepared with that gospel of peace and above all, taking up the shield of faith, that shield that quenches all the fiery darts of the evil one, of the wicked one. We need to have that shield of faith. We need to have faith practice faith, acquire faith by being in the word and being on our knees in prayer and trusting the Lord for all things. So we need to quench those fiery darts. We need to have that faith. So we stand uh, having our uh, loins girt with truth. We have truth. We have righteousness. We're prepared with the gospel of peace. We have faith. And then we take on the helmet of salvation. Of course, we must be saved. And I've told you before, Paul has told you before in scripture, check it before you wreck it. That's not exact wording that Paul used. But the point is, we need to make sure we're saved. We need to examine our salvation. Don't doubt it. I'm not trying to get you to doubt your salvation, but always examine and make sure it's true. Because many, brethren, many who uh, occupy pews in the United States of America are going to burn in an eternal hell because no one told them they need to examine their salvation and examine their faith. So we need to have faith. We need to have that helmet of salvation. And the only offensive weapon that we have is the sword of the spirit. And the sword of the spirit are the truths. It should be swords of the spirit is probably a better uh, rendition of that. There are swords within the word of God. And one of the truths is that we need to have the armor of God. That's a truth. Be sober, be vigilant, your adversary, the devil. That is a truth. That is a sword available to us. We need to have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We need to be hiding God's word in our hearts that we might not sin against him. We need to allow his word to change us. We need to allow his word to bring us about. We need to hide his word in our heart that we're able to fight that battle, that we're not fumbling around for the weapons. The weapon is at hand because the weapon is in our hearts. This is very important. The actual pieces of armor and the ancient use for them is not all that important. Um, it makes an interesting comparison. It may be memorable, but we need to have truth. We need to have righteousness. We need to be have the preparation of the gospel of peace, faith, and salvation, and the sword of the spirit. Because we're fighting not fleshly enemies, but it's the spiritual battle. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 goes like this. For though we walk in the flesh, and we do, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not meat, they're not bodily, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And when I read that bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, I think not only of the, the thoughts of the evil ones, the thoughts of those who need Christ yet, but also my thoughts need to be brought into captivity. I need to be fighting that spiritual warfare within myself, the old nature versus the new nature. I need to give God the victory in my heart and in my mind, and I need to allow those to be surrendered to the Lord. Now that we are talking about a spiritual battle, but that spiritual battle is sometimes manifest in an evil world. And that does it's important for us not to become monastic in our beliefs, you know, not hide in a monastery, not hide in our prayer closet. Yes, we need to enter our prayer closet and yes, spend generous amounts of time there. But if we stay in our prayer closet, we're not useful for the Lord in this world because we need to walk around in this world. We need to take care of those whom we love. That's why we wear seatbelts when we drive. It's why we get a uh, physical once in a while and do as the doctor says when the doctor makes sense and we 
pursue health in our bodies. We exercise, we eat right, we get plenty of rest, we avoid danger, we lock our doors, we wear our seat belts, we do the things we need to do to protect ourselves on this earthly plane. I'm very impressed with a man, uh, you may have heard of him, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, he was a uh, minister in Nazi Germany. And when the Nazis were taking over, when his nation was falling apart, he was doing two things. He was establishing a seminary and teaching young men how to rightly divide the word of truth. And he was fighting Nazis. I have great admiration for him. And if you've known me for any amount of time, you say, yeah, that's probably, that's probably Robert's uh, greatest earthly hero. And I think you would be right. And he had a good balance of things. And we need to have a good balance. We can't spend all our, our days in monasticism and be hidden away looking at scripture and praying, although those are excellent pursuits. But we also cannot be so caught up in the activism of the day, in the politics of the day, we can't just be social justice warriors running around trying to tell the evil lost world how to live because that's not really what we're about. Although we do need to take up social causes from time to time. We do need to stand for truth in this lost and dying world. But we also need to spend time in our prayer closet and partake in that spiritual warfare. That time we spend in our prayer closet on our knees, that time we spend on the word helps us to be prepared for that battle we must face on an earthly plane as well as on the spiritual plane. So we can recognize in an instant whether we just need to speak the truth to someone and say, yes, abortion is murder. You need to know that. But you need also to know, preparation of the gospel of peace, that Jesus loves you and he can forgive you. Jesus loves you and he can guide you through this seeming impossible situation you're in and help this to turn into a win rather than a loss without having to murder your child. We need to balance our attack. We need to be fighting that spiritual warfare, our hearts and minds, and then for the hearts and minds of those, the lost and dying world around us. So how are we going to do that? Well, our resources are very clear. <clears throat> Excuse me. In verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. We need to be looking out for one another in prayer. As you as often as you think about your brethren, be praying for them. If you see something in a store that reminds you of someone in your Sunday school class, pray for them. If you see something that reminds you or hear something maybe on television that you say, you know, that's kind of how the pastor talks about it. Lift up a prayer for the pastor. He's under attack. He's going to always be under attack because he rightly divides the word of truth, because he loves his people, because he wants his people to walk in the Lord and not in the flesh. And because he does that, he's under attack. Pray for him. Pray for his beloved wife. She's so sweet and wonderful. Pray for her. Pray for the people that are the leaders in our church. Help them to fight the battle by lifting them up in prayer. Praying always. Praying always, watching thereunto, making supplications for all saints. And of course, be praying for those that are off doing the missionary work. Be praying for the missionaries we're supporting out in the field. You think we have it bad here in America? Try doing it over there. Try doing it over there without the rights and freedoms that we have. They're very, very often in physical, uh, mortal, grave danger. Pray for them. Lift them up because they're boldly proclaiming the gospel. They're boldly prepared with the gospel of peace, and they're uh, sharing that gospel of peace with those around them in a very dangerous place. That's why we're supporting them, because they're doing it right. Support them in prayer as well. And for me, the utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth. Pray for Paul, is what he's saying. Pray for me. So be praying for your pastor. Pray for Robert as he tries to prepare Sunday school lessons and tries to uh, represent you in this teaching and, and to rightly divide this word, be in prayer for those around you. Be in prayer for those who lead you. Be in prayer for the brethren. So Paul was an ambassador in bonds. He was in jail, but he's saying, look, be in prayer for me. Um, he wants to speak boldly, and he did. And he lost his life because of his bold proclamation of the gospel. Luke 18, 1, uh, 
And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray. We're talking about Jesus. He's about to enter into a couple prayers, a couple, uh, sorry, not a couple prayers, a couple parables about how men ought always to pray. And we should always pray. Like I said, we can't always be in our prayer closets, but we need to long be in our prayer closets and frequently be in our prayer closets. And he went on, Jesus went on to talk about the persistent widow and the judge. Remember her persistence? We covered that uh, when we covered our unit on prayer. She kept bothering him. She kept showing up. She kept asking and asking and asking and asking. And she got her way because she was persistent in prayer. And then the Pharisee and the public and the Pharisee stood, went off to the front and stood in front of everyone and raised his hands and said, oh, look how wonderful I am, Lord. I'm so thankful I'm not like that clown in the back. And that clown in the back was that publican, that tax collector who dared not even lift his head. He had his head bowed in shame and he beat upon his breast and said, Lord, have pity on mercy on me, a sinner. I, I just want to get better. I want to get over being me. I despise who I am. And we need to have that ability, brethren. We need to be able to approach the Lord in prayer and despise our sin and despise our worldliness, despise our sloth and yearn to be more what God would have us to be. That's our resource. That's our power. It doesn't sound like a very powerful move. I didn't talk about a caliber or uh, how accurate it was at miles of range. I didn't talk about uh, the, uh, all I'm talking about is prayer here. It is a very powerful resource. Second Timothy 4, 1 through 5 says, I charge you therefore before God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. This is a setup. I'm charging you that this is the, the powerful statement. He's saying, look, you need to do this. And I say this before God, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, we need to do this in love, obviously. Let me, let me read on and uh, then I'll preach on it. <laughs> uh, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Now, this doesn't sound very lovey-dovey, and it's really not. We need to get away from the notion that says that, you know, the world wants to say, judge not. Don't look at the people's lives and tell them they're wrong. That's not what this says here. Now, when scripture says judge not, it's talking about condemnation. I can't look at you and say, ah, oh, you're a just, you're horrible. You're lost. Get away from me. That's, that's judging not. That, we, we shouldn't do that. But we do need to evaluate. We do need to inspect the fruit. We do need to watch out for one another to make sure that we don't go astray. And how do we do that? We preach the word. Everybody needs to preach the word, not just the preacher. Not just the pastor, but we all need to. And how are you going to preach the word? Well, spend time in the word. Spend time in prayer. And the spirit will move you. He will give you the weapons you need to speak out. Be instant. Be ready. In season and out of season. And uh, John MacArthur makes it very clear and very wisely says what it means, what in season means and what out of season means does not matter. Because it's either in season or out of season. And either way. We need to be prepared. We need to be rebuking, reproving, and exhorting with all long suffering and doctrine. Whether in season or out of season, be prepared, be ready, have the word hidden in your heart, have been hidden in your prayer closet, and then come out to do that battle. Be prepared to preach the word in season or out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. These are strong words, and we do need to be strong in it, but not without love. Certainly not without love. So that's the charge for Timothy. And that's the charge for us. These are our resources. So here's our epilogue. Here's the, here's the, the conclusion of it all. Pa Paul is wrapping it up. But teach me also know my affairs. He wants to be very clear. He's sending Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister of the Lord, to make them. He's provided for them. He still cares about them. Paul is in prison. 
And even though he's a Roman citizen, they're going to they're gonna, uh, not do him right. He says, I've sent him unto you. I'm sending you somebody. I care about you. I'm sending somebody who's here comforting me, who's here taking this dictation. Uh, he was my secretary. He was helping me in my time of imprisonment. And now I'm sending him to you. I could use the comfort, but I'm sending him to you because I want you to be comforted. I sent him unto you for that same purpose, that ye might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to you, brethren. Paul, who's not experiencing a peaceful situation, has the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and wants them to have it too. This should not be a pity party. We're entering into a, a, an awful time, brethren. Our, but it's also a joyous and wonderful time. And that sounds like a contradiction in terms, and maybe it is. Our nation is falling apart. But you know what? The church doesn't have to. Our God is not falling apart. The truth of the gospel is not falling apart. The peace that we can have through our Lord Jesus Christ will not fall apart. We're not falling apart. The world is. So peace be unto you. You can have peace and we need to be ambassadors to this world to show them that they too can have peace. So peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all of them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. He wants them to have peace. He's sending his right hand man that they might have peace. It's very important that we be surrendered to the Lord and we can have the peace so we can fight the earthly battles that we have. We must win that spiritual warfare in order to participate in the earthly warfare. So when we're taken into prison, and it's going to happen in our lifetime, brethren, we will be persecuted. Christians will be jailed for standing for the truth. Christians will be jailed for worshiping. Christians will be jailed for operating according to their conscience, telling others that they shouldn't abort their babies. The courts have already interfered in a church that was meeting on a sidewalk in front of an abortion clinic, and the courts are interfering with that. The courts are casting preachers into prison for preaching the gospel. It's happening now. We need to be prepared with the gospel of peace. We need to put on the whole armor of God. We need to have that peace that passes all understanding. Paul is wishing that for the church at Ephesus, and he's wishing that for us as well. Romans 1.13 says, Paul is talking about, I wouldn't want you to be ignorant, brethren, that oft times I wanted to come to you. He says, you know, I'm sorry, I wanted to come to you. I wanted you to have the preparation that I had for you, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And this is the example for us. These are trying times. These are horrible times. I never thought I'd see these days in America, but they're here. But the answer is not to hide in our closets. Our, our answer is not to bolt our door and to cower in fear. But our answer is to trust in the Lord and extend peace to the brethren and expand, extend the gospel of peace, the true gospel to a lost and dying world. That needs to be our goal while we're doing this. We need to be rescuing people from the fire and not standing outside, chewing on our fingers, saying, wow, that's a tough fire. We need to get in there and be rescuing people from certain death. And bear with me, I'm going to read a long section from John 9, but I think it's important. <clears throat> we're talking about a blind man, and, and as Jesus passed by, we're in verse 1, John, uh, John chapter 9. He saw a man which was blind from birth and his disciples asking him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither has this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day and the night cometh when no man can work. Does that sound like what we're experiencing now? As long as I am in the world, he goes on, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said unto him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he, he did all that. And then he, said, uh, he was able to see. And he was told to go show himself. Uh, and they brought to the Pharisees him that afore was blind. They heard about what was going on. 
and it was the Sabbath day. And so they're trying to catch Jesus in his sin. I'm trying to skip around for you here. And they said unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him uh, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, uh, he said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind. They, they doubted his story. And so they brought his parents in. They said, what's going on here? Well, they said he was blind from birth. And they said, well, was it a prophet that healed him? Was it a, just a man? What was it? And they said, we don't know. We weren't there. Ask him. And so they asked him. Then again, they called the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise and this is a phony reverence to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. And the point of this is this. We will be confronted by those that are lost uh, to give an account for our beliefs. We will be attacked for our beliefs. We'll also be brought before uh Christian folks sometimes, possibly, we may have another inquisition or something, but we need to know this. We may not have the testimony uh, that sounds all flowery and wonderful. We might not have a great education, but we can testify of what has happened in our life. Facing the Pharisees and those who would uh, try to rattle him and get him to say something that was not true, he said, I don't know. I don't know all these things, but this I do know. I once was blind. And now I see. And brethren, while we're in these troubling times, while we're uh, caught in this battle where we may have very real physical danger, you may get caught up in a riot. You may be cast into prison for worshiping as God has intended for you to worship. You may end up in trouble. You may lose your job for taking a Christian stand. It can happen. It's happening. But even while this is happening, we need to be ready to testify in season or out of season. I don't know, <coughs> excuse me, what you're dealing with, we can say to people, but I know this. I was blind, but now I see. Do you want to see? Will you be made well? Come to Jesus. He loves you. We need to have the gospel of peace and be prepared. We need to arm ourselves. We need to have faith. We need to have the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of truth. And, and uh, we need to have girded with truth and the sword of the spirit. I misspoke. But we need to have that armor of God. We need to be prepared to share with people and love them. These are challenging and horrible times. And these are wonderful, exciting times, brethren, because it's exciting. If we can do what God would have us do, we will be fit warriors in the battle. And we can be used to the Lord. And therein is the excitement. For God to use us, to see God work in the lives of those around us, that we encourage the brethren, that we lift up the brethren, we preach the gospel, and we share the gospel with lost and dying men and rescue them from this hellish uh, political situation we're in and bring them into the family of God. This is our calling. This is our duty. Oh my goodness, this is what we need to do. This is the exciting thing. The first three chapters talked about what, it, what the definition of the universal church and Paul has told us what we need to do. This is what we need to do. If we are the universal church, we need to be wrapped in the arm. So there we have it. That's the completion of the book of Ephesians. It's exciting, isn't it? Let us be equipped warriors. Let us have on the whole armor of God. That we may be able to, st we may be able to stand in the evil day. I want to stand, brethren. I hope you do too. It is my desire to serve the Lord well. We don't have to be sophisticated or even educated. We simply need to yield to God's word. We need to bow in prayer and surrender our lives to him on a daily basis. Take up our cross daily and follow him. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for Christ's sake will save it. I, that's not a light statement in these days. That is not a light statement. Are you prepared to make that statement? Are you prepared to lay down your life, to set your personal little goals, your little kingdom aside and take on the cause of Christ in these desperate times? We're coming into a time of, of uh, troubling political climate, even anarchy. And we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared with the gospel to take it out to that lost and dying world. We need to be rescuing sinners from this painful, painful time. 
it is painful to see this uh, happening in our nation. I love our nation. See, I, I love America. But you know what I love more? I love you more. I love God more. And I love people more. I don't know anybody that I want to die and go to hell. There's some that I like to smack around maybe a little bit or, or lecture them or uh, restrict their behaviors. But I don't want anybody to go to hell, do you? Let us be in prayer and in the word and prepared for the conflict that is here and the worsening conflict ahead so we can be soldiers of the light. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your word. We thank you that you love us so and you provided for us, given us all the equipment, all the armor that we need. You've told us what we need to do to honor you in these grave times. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to be selfless. Help us to lift up the name of Jesus everywhere we go, that all men be drawn unto you. We ask these things in the name of our precious Savior and Lord. Amen.